Hi, welcome to the IBM Spectrum Protect 811 technical update. My name is Trisha Chong, and I'm working with Sean Sperry to introduce you to the new features inside of Spectrum Protect version 811. This is the list of the new features and functions that 811 introduced. Sean and I will walk you through these different features. IBM Cloud Object Storage has multiple offerings available. The first is the IBM Cloud Object Storage on-premise, where a customer can buy the hardware and software and implement it as a cloud in their own data center. Spectrum Protect has supported this as an on-premise cloud for multiple versions. IBM Cloud Object Storage also has an off-premise offering that's through SoftLayer, also known as Bluemix. And this offering is available as both a public and private offering. And what we're introducing in IBM Spectrum Protect version 811 is the ability to configure cloud container storage pools to use the IBM Cloud Object Storage via the S3 API to back up their data to. And so previously you could configure the cloud container storage pools with the on-premise or via the Swift API. And so what we're introducing in 811 is the S3 API to the Bluemix soft layer interface. Inside of the operation center, if you go to the storage, storage pool, and click on the plus storage pool, you will then get the ability to choose an off-premise container, and you can point to this new IBM Cloud Object Storage S3 API soft layer. You can enable encryption if you'd like, and after you click Next on this, you will then be prompted for some information that's specific to the Bluemix offering. If you go to the Bluemix offering page and you've set up your account and you've chosen object storage, you'll see out there both your access key ID and your secret access key. And these are two of the pieces that we'll need when we're entering the requested information in the wizard. You'll also want to create a bucket. These are also known as vaults. And you can do that by clicking on the Manage Bucket piece inside of the Bluemix interface. And you can create a bucket name, whatever you want to call it. You'll enter that bucket name over here. The one additional piece of information you'll need from the Bluemix interface is the URL that you want to access the storage from. In my case, I chose the US Geo and I copied this URL over. Now one thing to note, when you enter this URL, you will need to preface it with an HTTPS, otherwise you will get an error. Once you've created your new offsite cloud container via the S3 API, if you need to edit it, you can go into the storage, storage pools details and look at the properties there. And if you unlock that information, you can then update things like access key IDs or bucket names or URLs. This is just like for other containers out there, the same type of ability to edit it. If you want to see a demo of me creating and working with an IBM Cloud Object Storage off-premise cloud that resides on the Bluemix interface, check out this YouTube video. Another new feature in version 8.1.1 is the ability to sort and filter the activity log entries when you're troubleshooting your server tasks. And this would be either the active tasks or the completed tasks. So inside of the operations center, underneath the server's server detail site, we have our active tasks and our completed tasks. If you click on one of these active or completed tasks, underneath it you'll see the list of activity log information associated with that task. And these activity log information are the messages that might be just information, they might be warning, or they might be error messages. And there can be thousands of messages associated with one specific task. So in previous releases, you were able to see the active tasks and completed tasks and the associated messages with that, but there was limited ability to sort those, to filter on them, and to export them to a file. In version 8.1.1, now you can go into these activity logs. You can do things like click on the header information and have it sort, or you can do complex searches using different filters. 
In addition, you can export the data in the activity log pane as a comma separated value to a file, for instance, to Excel. If you look at this example, here we have the operation center. We've gone into server, under the server tab. We've gone into the details. And either in the active task or completed task, I can choose one of these tasks and see the messages below that that are associated with those in the activity log. Now, if I wanted to do some diagnosis or search on that, I can now do things like click on the headers and have them sort by, for instance, the date and time or the status. I can also go in and do complex filters, which will maybe limit the number of messages I see or just show the specific messages. Now remember, when you do these searches, you can do just one search or you can click on the plus sign and do a complex search that consists of multiple parameters. You can also export this information to, for instance, Excel by clicking on this icon and then perhaps send that exported information to the owner of that server where the errors are occurring or to whomever needs to take a look at it. I do have a YouTube out there if you want to see a demo of me walking through these new features. The activity log shows up in multiple places, including inside of your alerts as well as your client on the operation center. But these enhancements are currently only in the active tasks and completed task field underneath the servers. We have blueprints available out on the web for customers looking to install a Spectrum Protect server. These blueprints help you with sizing the server, with the layout. There's actual scripts that, which will automate the server installation. Server blueprints come in three sizes. They come in small, medium, and large, depending on the amount of data you're looking at protecting. And what we've introduced is the updates to our Linux and Windows blueprints so that they're same as our AIX version 3.1 blueprints. And so in these updates, you'll see for small systems, we now use the SSD drives to process a large daily workload. For the large system size, we now use the StoreWise V5030 second generation hardware with distributed arrays, and this will help you lower the cost and improve efficiency. Also for the large systems, we are taking advantage of our new six terabyte database limit inside of Spectrum Protect server. We've also refreshed the x86 server models so that we're using the newer x3650 M5s and we're including the newer Xeon processors for the E526XX version four generation. If you're looking at installing a new Spectrum Protect server, be sure to first check out the blueprints and that will help you with the sizing and the installation scripts to get that up and running very rapidly. In version 8.1.1, we have introduced support for a Windows 2016 Spectrum Protect server. So you can now install IBM Spectrum Protect 8.1.1 server on the Microsoft Windows Server 2016 operating system. In this version, we do not support clustered environments. That will be in a later version. Now we did support Windows 2016 for our Spectrum Protect clients and our data protection modules back in version 8.1. If you want to see the entire platform support list, do take a look at this URL. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sean to walk you through the rest of the enhancements. Thank you, Tricia. So to wrap up this presentation, we're going to talk about a few features for Spectrum Protect for Virtual Environments and the new S3 device certification program that we are implementing. So starting with data protection for VMware, we have released support for VMware version 6.5 at data protection for virtual environments version 8.1.0.1. So we are supporting a VMware version 6.5 environment. There are a couple of restrictions at this time. New VMs with encryption VMs stored on VVols at version 6.5, although 6.0 is supported. And then finally, the limitation uh, not currently supporting the vSphere 6.5 HTML5 based vSphere web client. We are in the process of working on those enhancements and working to support that environment, those particular aspects of version 6.5. 
So I would expect those to come out in the fairly soon future. As always, I would encourage you, if you're looking for specific support requirements and versions supported, go out there and Google Spectrum Protect for Virtual Environments All Requirements document. That's the link there, so if you download the presentation, you can get that. But if you could just Google the All Requirements document, you'll see the detailed information about the version supported and what particular features and functionality uh, things may be limited to. The next enhancement or change that I'd like to discuss is with self-service file restore. And this is really not a change in the underlying code for Spectrum Protect for virtual environments, but more a documentation change and a requirements change. You recall that Spectrum Protect for Virtual Environments Data Protection for VMware supports a self-service file restore portal where users can go in and restore their own files to virtual machines based on the permissions inside those virtual machines. Now, the previous documentation for this product required that the infrastructure used to mount the virtual machines have a domain administrator user defined to it so that it can do those mounts and look up the permissions in Active Directory. Now with either version 7.1.6 or version 8.1.x, you can define that administrator that does the mounts as a local administrator as opposed to a domain administrator. So that's a lot less authorization that's required, a lot less power that's required, a lower level of Windows authorization that's not required. And from a security perspective, that presents a lot less risk to a lot of people. So we wanted to make that change available in the documentation so that everyone knew of this configuration setting and how to do this to support that enhanced security. If you download the presentation, at the bottom of this, you'll see a tech note with all of the details of uh, the setup and what's required. So moving on to support for object storage devices. If you've been following our update presentations, you probably know that we are constantly adding support for cloud storage and specifically S3-based object storage devices. So we currently support IBM Cloud Object Storage using the S3 protocol. We, in, we support the Amazon Web Services or AWS S3 service and we also support Swift devices today. We've gotten a lot of requests from different vendors who are now producing object storage devices for us to certify or verify that Spectrum Protect will indeed work with those devices. And what we found is that from an implementation perspective, the S3 implementations for those devices might vary slightly or be slightly different than the S3 standard that, that is implemented and documented by Amazon. So what we've decided to do is offer a S3 object storage verification program for third-party object storage devices. This will allow a vendor to do is to basically self-certify their device for use with Spectrum Protect. So the process for this is going to be the vendor is going to obtain a certification package from IBM. It's going to contain code, testing instructions, and testing tools. They'll run the test against their device and then submit the information back to IBM, at which point we will validate the results and we will certify that that device has indeed been tested with Spectrum Protect and it will be listed as a certified device on our web page. For those of you who are interested in it, submit a request to Jordan Gruber, whose email is down there. He will be able to get you information on this storage verification program. So I hope you found that information useful. 
and please subscribe to our channel for more videos and more technical information on Spectrum Protect.